So for the most part, again, the autonomic nervous system, for the most part, it uses those two neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and norepinephrine, but there are other neurotransmitters that come into play in specific cases as well. So we just wanna make note of that. We don't wanna completely skip over that. Um, there are some autonomic neurons that are said to be non-adrenergic and non-cholinergic. They use other sorts of neurotransmitters. There are some examples of those listed, other types of neurotransmitters. Nitric oxide, NO, this is one that we will be seeing uh, in a couple of locations throughout the course. This is one that is really important for regulating blood flow to the brain. Um, so nitric oxide, this causes blood vessels to dilate, which is really important if you need to route, for example, glucose to a particular region of the brain that's really active, then um, just being able to release nitric oxide to facilitate that blood flow is very important. And then this comes up in a few other organ systems as well. So we'll be seeing that as we go forward in the course. This is something we've already said, but just to really drive it home, most organs have dual innervation. Most organs are innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Uh, so that is generally true. And this is important because sometimes, for example, with heart rate, sometimes we need to increase heart rate. That's what the sympathetic division would do. Other times we need to decrease heart rate and get a little bit more relaxed. That's what the parasympathetic division would do. So a few different examples of um, dual innervation listed out here for you to consider. As a final note, there are some situations where this dual innervation can lead to complementary effects or cooperative effects. And so we tend to think of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions as antagonists, and they are generally, they kind of do opposite things, but there are some exceptions to that. So I'd like for you to know that there are some situations where these two divisions do actually work together in order to accomplish some overall goal in the body. I started out this chapter saying that autonomic is kind of like automatic. The autonomic nervous system takes care of things that need to happen automatically in the body. And that is true, um, but just to make the full, the full connection here, there is a link between conscious control, conscious thought in the brain and the central nervous system and this autonomic nervous system. So um, in general, these autonomic reflexes are being originated in, in the medulla. Um, the medulla is what controls a lot of our cardiovascular, pulmonary, and other sorts of organ system functions that happen automatically. But um, remember back when we were talking about the central nervous system, there are a lot of interconnections and there are truly interconnections between the higher brain regions and the cerebrum and that medulla that's controlling all of these things. So there is a connection between those two. This means, uh, for example, when you experience perhaps emotional situations, if you, I don't know, if you get embarrassed about something, right, emotional states, this leads to blushing, and that's because there is a connection between what's going on in your higher brain region, so maybe you've, you've you got kind of embarrassed about something, that ends up leading to activation of the medulla. This is gonna activate the autonomic nervous system and cause a lot of those automatic responses that you don't have control over. For example, blushing. Um, so there are connections between these two when you, um, especially with the limbic system, like if you are experiencing emotional reactions to things, that's going to influence what's going on with the autonomic nervous system and um, the medulla is kind of like the, the connecting thing. The medulla oblongata is the connecting region between the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system.